of the seminar committee. On behalf of Egypt University, it is wonderful to have you all here this morning to attend the first economical financial seminar in Egypt University, Economic and Financial Issues in Kurdistan. We are honored to have President with us today, President of Egypt University, and our keynote speakers and all honored guests, welcome and thank you for being here. There could not be real recipes or, or magic formulas on most effective initiatives for economic and financial development. But I believe open and serious discussion could be a step forward in increasing awareness and finding the best answer. We truly value your participation and support for this seminar. We wish all of you unforgettable seminar. Thank you so much for coming and for your attention. Enjoy the seminar. Thank you. It's our great pleasure to have the welcome remarks from Dr. Fateh, Dean Faculty of Economic and Business Administration. Representatives, colleagues, and dear guests, I would like to start my speech first introducing myself briefly. My name is Fatih Jura. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences. I would like to welcome everyone here on behalf of my faculty, Manishik University, and our rector, Professor Dr. Ahmed Ostash. He was not able to join the seminar because of his health conditions. So he regretted uh, his situation. He conveyed a uh, warm welcome to everyone. And I would like to convey that. Today, our seminar on current financial and economic issues in Kurdistan. This seminar, we believe, it is going to be the first of its kind and will be very fruitful both for business and academic world. Finance sector is the leading power for any nation to develop and the exploit the opportunities available to them to become a developer for any country and especially for Iraq. Of course, we shouldn't forget that even though it provides as many as opportunities possible, there lies many risks also. So from that perspective, we should never forget that we have to educate and train our human resources for these risky situations. So as Michigan University, under our faculty, we started banking and finance department this year with this idea of providing well-educated human resources to the industry for this country to develop. So for these purposes, we are looking forward to the support of business world and other official institutions too. So today in our seminar, we will cover wide arrays of presenters they are going to provide solutions maybe to the current economical and financial problems and issues here in this Iraq and Kurdistan. So the specifically we would like to evaluate the oil uh, dependency of the Iraq uh, for, from the economic perspective. Then the role of banking sector for the development of Iran and Islamic financial, con financial concept of Tekafil, so on, so other issues we will cover. So I would like to welcome everyone today again to benefit from this seminar. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Bradcom. Mr. Brad is the principal of Definix and Dab Global Companies.
And what about the presentation? This is new technology for me. Ah, okay, okay. But also from this I can. Perfect. Okay, thank you. I, I hope everybody has the same challenges with these things that I do uh, these days. My name is Brad Camp. I'm an independent energy analyst uh, based here uh, in Erbil. I've lived in Erbil for the past six years with my private, I feel I'm getting a little bit of feedback. This is better. Uh, I've lived in Edinburgh for the past six years uh, with my private sector company, looking at political and economic risk uh, involved with the development of energy. Uh, most of my clients are the major international oil and energy companies uh, that are present in the market here. My total coverage of Iraq has been for about the past eight years. Prior to my private sector life, I was a U.S. diplomat. I served two years here to the predecessor of the U.S. consulate, uh, which was known as a regional embassy office, as the head. Uh, after that, I left and went to Washington for a year where I worked at the White House in the Iraq-Afghanistan office, or what we called the war office uh, at the time. Post-Washington, I ended up in Baghdad for about one year, living in the green zone and working on the civilian presence or managing the civilian presence that was also out in the regions. Uh, in Iraq. I saw too much business opportunity in the Kurdistan region uh, to pass up and decided to leave my government job uh, and start my own independent company here in the region. During my time here as a U.S. diplomat, I made friends with many of the important political figures as well as many of the essential business figures that were going to launch the economy of the Kurdistan region. I was very lucky to start off with a very interesting project from the get-go, uh, working with Sheikh Baz Karim and the car group on the Airbill refinery uh, and the Hormala Dome development project. From that, I did all the commercial uh, work between car and its suppliers, vendors, its bankers, uh, and also uh, with uh, the government. Uh, that was a fascinating project, which is now delivering over half of the petrol uh, provided to the vehicles uh, in the Kurdistan region. My business expand, expanded from that as we saw major international oil companies come in who weren't only interested in the risk of the resource below the ground, but also how are we going to turn that resource into money? And when we turn that resource into money, it's not just our money, we're also in a partnership with the government, and thus, as we see in the West, with the people. And how then is the government going to manage that money? How is the government going to manage those resources? How are the lives of the people uh, going to change? Because without a friendly atmosphere, we are unable to invest here. We're unable to maximize uh, our uh, profits uh, and thus the profits of the entire region. Uh, and so I help companies wade through uh, those types of issues. Unfortunately, in the oil and gas sector right now, we're not at the stage of answers. We're at the stage of questions. And so we won't conclude today uh, with a set of recommendations uh, that I come up with or that we jointly come up with. But I think we can conclude with a set of questions that are really important for the people of Kurdistan to start considering uh, as they move forward. Okay, tell me to. We'll start off with risk management. And I am very open to this being an interactive session. So at any point, if you have a question, a clarification, or a comment, uh, please do not hesitate uh, to, to jump in. When we look at risk management, I want to break it into two categories. We have political risk, which includes internal dynamics within Kurdistan, Iraq in a greater whole, uh, and the region uh, that this uh, region lies within. Then we have the resource. Uh, as well. It's easy for me to say on the resource, no problem. So far there's an estimated 45 billion barrels of oil that have been found in the Kurdistan region. 
uh, and uh, enough gas to power the lives of the people for generations uh, to come. But it's limited, and we'll go a little bit more into detail about what those limits do to challenge society and to challenge economic uh, development. But first, let's talk a little bit about risk and start with political risk and internal dynamics within uh, Kurdistan. We've seen over 50 oil and gas agreements signed uh, by the regional government uh, with international investors here. Many of those international investors have now found oil, and they're starting to think about their development plan for bringing that oil to market. From zero barrels of oil production in 2007, when the oil and gas law was passed, to about 300,000 barrels a day of oil production now, in a market that is incredibly unstable for international investors. Although international investors aren't afraid of unstable markets. It's just the risk return that must be judged uh, in an unstable market. But 300,000 barrels of production now achieved uh, in uh, an unstable market. Why unstable? Well, we continue to have security risk within Iraq as a whole. Uh, we have monetization risk. What's the relationship between Adbil and Baghdad going to be when it comes to turning that oil into money? Uh, for my company. But we see the leaders here continuing uh, to make quite wise decisions uh, on the development of oil and gas resources. First of all, they recognize that to open this market up in this instability uh, to international companies, they had to give good reward for that to happen. We saw the first round of oil agreements given to small companies. You couldn't get Exxon and Chevron and Total uh, at that time to consider opportunities here because of the ambiguities, because of the cloudiness uh, of the sector. No matter how good you made the deals, uh, they just weren't willing to come. So the government here made a very practical decision and said, let's go find what we call wildcatters. Companies that go out and all they want to do is find oil and then sell the right to develop that oil uh, in the future and move on to the next market where they can simply find oil. In that wild catting phase, we saw good, good terms given to those companies to come here and develop the oil and gas resources. Over time, if you would have talked to the minister, Dr. Ashti Harami, in 2007 and 2008, he would tell you exactly where we would be today. Companies would have found oil and larger companies would come in and start consolidating those resources where they have the corporate capital to then invest them and produce them uh, quite rapidly. As a citizen of Kurdistan, or even as an industry watcher, everyone should be quite happy to see that as that transition happens from the early wildcat stage to the stage that we're in now, we've seen the financial terms of the agreements tightened. Every time a company opens the agreement up for a material change, I need to delay my program a little bit, I want to bring in a new investor, I want to sell. Uh, the ministry uses that opportunity as well to tighten the financial terms. Why? Because first of all, the resource risk is now gone. In 2007, although many Iraqis will tell you, and I think Kurds as well, there's oil under every piece of our land, it's just not true. And we've seen multiple companies attempt to find oil here and haven't found oil. They've left after spending 100, 200, $250 million exploring for oil and found nothing. That's a large amount of money for a company to risk uh, to, to not find anything. This one, okay, thank you. Now that that risk, as I say, no problem, the resource problem is gone, those companies, uh, the ministry has been able to tighten those financial terms, taking that piece of risk uh, out of the way. The current risk that we face is turning the oil into money and the politics of that. The Constitution, and I won't give you a constitutional lecture today, although if you have some questions, I'm more than happy to talk about it. But Article 112 of the Constitution is very, very interesting. It governs oil and gas. And it has a very distinct word, both in the English translation, uh, but also in the Arabic, the source language of the Constitution. And it says that there will be cooperative management of the extracted oil. Extracted is a very important word that's there. 
in English, and they tell me as in Arabic as well, because I'm not a fluent Arabic speaker, that it is the past tense. It means oil that is already out of the ground. So the Kurds argue rightfully, I think, under Article 112 of the Constitution, that bringing the oil from underneath the ground to on top of the ground in a state ready to market, in a state ready to monetize, to turn it into money, they have complete rights. I agree with this. Is it sticky? Is it a sticky situation for the, governor, uh, the government in Baghdad? Yes. They're looking south to Basra, which produces right now uh, two and a half million barrels of oil a day. They look to the Anbar Desert with its gas resources. They look north to the Sunni territory that they continue to marginalize development-wise. And they say, how are we ever going to have any control over this country if we don't control the resource under the ground? Well, they gave up that right in Article 112 uh, of the Constitution. The Constitution also is symmetrical. It's not asymmetrical. It says any producing region or governorate. It doesn't say the Kurds have a special right. We understand them as a special situation. They fell more greatly under the tyranny of the previous regime, and thus we give them a way forward separate from the rest of the country. It says any producing region or governorate. There's symmetry there. Any right exercised in the Kurdistan region today, any right exercised in the Kurdistan region today and recognized by Baghdad should be recognizable to any other governorate uh, in Iraq. This is a major shift from control, uh, the nature of Baghdad, of controlling the system. Uh, that will take, and as we are seeing, is taking time uh, to overcome. But we're at a very interesting window right now in Erbil Baghdad relationships on this subject. There is a pipeline connection now into uh, the Turkish pipeline network. There are two pipelines that run from Kirkuk to Jehan, a port on the Mediterranean Sea in Turkey. One is a 46 inch line and it's carried historically Kirkuk crude from the fields of the Kirkuk area to the port in Jehan for sale onward to international markets. Right beside it, there's a 40 inch, a smaller line that line was actually built in the late 70s to carry Basra crude to the port in Jehan. There have been multiple wars since the 70s, as many of you have lived, uh, and including two of those wars of which my country participated in, the 1991 and the 2003 wars, where that pipeline has been bombed and never rebuilt from Basra uh, to uh, Beijing, uh, let's say. And so that pipeline has more or less been laying without usage uh, in it. Over the past 18 months, the Kurds have built a pipeline that now goes across the territory of Kurdistan in multiple sizes and ties in to that unused 40-inch line. That tie-in is complete. Oil has flowed uh, through that pipeline uh, to the port in Turkey. But there's a pause right now on flowing oil. Because just as the Kurds had the ability to flow that oil, Baghdad said, wait, 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 we need to talk about this. You know, talk doesn't usually happen unless you have leverage. There's no reason to sit at a table uh, as the child. Uh, there's no reason to sit at the table as the father uh, if you're in these types of political situations. It's best when you come man to man, excuse me, ladies, person to person uh, to the table uh, and have these discussions. Uh, with full respect and full leverage on each side. The Kurds have tried to solve these problems since 2007. There have been multiple attempts to afford oil and gas law for the federal government. There have been multiple attempts for a revenue sharing law in the federal government without any avail. Mr. Sheristani and, and his team was going forward with the development of southern oil fields, quite happy. The Kurds were going forward with the development of their oil fields, quite happy. There wasn't really a need. But as soon as that pipeline connection was made and there is ability to deliver produced oil from this region into clear, transparent international markets, you saw a dialogue started. Prime Minister Nechavan Barzani went to Baghdad Christmas, December 25th of last year, started a dialogue with 
Hussein Sherastani, the Deputy Prime Minister, as well as Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki. And he left, from all reports, quite optimistic. Finally, he thought, I have a counterparty to sit and have a discussion with and a counterparty that can make a decision and come to an agreement. The Kurds took the process very seriously. They wrote a 10 plus page way forward plan uh, with Baghdad. They meticulously translated into Arabic so that not a single word could be misunderstood and used uh, in the future. And finally, about the second week of January, submitted their plan to Baghdad. It was an A to Z plan. Probably a little bit too much for Baghdad to, to digest uh, at this time. Uh, but it really laid out the vision, uh, as the Kurds would see it, uh, of oil going forward. Baghdad, of course, responded and said, wait, 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 wait. This is too big for us uh, to do right now. We're in election season. Uh, you know, we're, we're in active war uh, in the Ambar province right now. Uh, we have to reignite our fight against terrorism uh, right now. We need cooperation on these things. This is just too big of a leap uh, for us to take right now. And we've seen what I would say is, to this point, a stalemate uh, in those negotiations, although the Prime Minister from here went to Turkey yesterday, and we'll be going to Baghdad tomorrow uh, to continue. With both sides feeling, according to my sources in Baghdad and here in Erbil, that there's good faith on both sides to come to some type of joint management uh, at this time. The Kurds are sitting at the table bold, though. They have a pipeline connection. They have a bilateral export agreement that Erbil signed with Ankara, allowing for this type of export to take place. Ankara has made the legal judgment under a bilateral agreement that it has with Iraq on pipeline usage, that it's legal, what they're doing with the Kurds. And so the Kurds are sitting at the table feeling bold. If we don't come to a joint agreement with you, Baghdad, which we're willing to do, we can go bilaterally with Turkey and do quite fine. I think there's one issue there, though, that people who work for the government or people who have family members, which all of you do that work for the government, uh, saw last month, and that's a delay in salary payments. At the end of last year, the Deputy Prime Minister Hussein al sharistani said, you know, we, there was a liability in the 2013 budget for Baghdad for the Kurds to export 250,000 barrels a day into the Iraqi system, and they didn't do it. We're going to hold their budget while we audit uh, that process. And Baghdad is claiming $10 billion uh, in fees owed to it because the Kurds failed to provide this oil into the system. And thus in January we saw a holding of the monthly transfer that the Kurdistan region gets from the Iraqi budget. That transfer is somewhere around $1.1 billion uh, a month. Sometimes I don't think uh, the people here uh, understand uh, what $1.1 billion per month is, means, looks like. It is a right. So when I talk about all of these things, I don't want to take that part away because I do think it is a right. Revenue sharing is always been a principle since, uh, since autonomy of the region happened. It's a principle in the Constitution uh, as well, and I think it's a right of the Kurds. But $1.1 billion ranks with the size of total revenue uh, of governments with much larger populations uh, than this one, who have to make their way. Yet when we didn't see the budget transfer of January happen, we saw salaries delayed. There was no, rain, we call them rainy day funds, a little bit of money you have in your pocket in case of a rainy day, no backup funds, no backup money to cover uh, for a while. So that's an important issue to think about, and we'll talk more. Hopefully this week we will see upon this dialogue between Bill and Baghdad some type of joint accommodation uh, of working together. I think it's good for the market, it's good for Iraq in this stage, it's good for the Kurds until they reach a level of export quantity to make up for the revenue uh, that they receive from Baghdad. And it also sets up generally a good attitude going into the April elections and then the government formation uh, after the April elections. 
uh, there. My prediction is, and to probably about a 75% feeling, is that we will see some type of joint cooperation between the two sides that will only last over the next year. We're about two months away from Iraqi elections now. Let me be very nice and say it's going to take six months to form a government, although maybe it takes nine, 12. And uh, none, none of us who live here in Kurdistan as we watch government formation happen can, uh, can laugh about that anymore because it's taking quite a long time here uh, as well to, to form a government. So I, I can see an interim agreement between Erbil and Baghdad lasting throughout that entire uh, process. There's some speculation that Kak Masoud may end up as the president of the republic. Uh, I put that as a very real uh, option. Uh, I don't know if it will happen or not, but I think it will be one of the options that's on the table during government formation. Uh, if he ends up in Baghdad as a political leader, how then does that change the political uh, dynamic is quite interesting questions that we just can't answer right now. What will joint management look like right now? SOMO is a very famous institution in Iraq. Uh, I actually disagree with my, with my dear friends uh, in government here. I think SOMO is a decent organization. It sells every barrel of Iraqi oil. It sells it at good, good prices, prices that are, you know, oil is usually sold at a discount to world price. It's sold at discounts very much like what the UAE, what Saudi Arabia, what its counterparts in the region sell their oil at. Uh, so I, and they don't do it for an expensive fee. Uh, they do it for a budget allocation simply from the Iraqi uh, government. If you look at the buyers of Iraqi oil, it's on the website every month, and it's companies that we all know. It's Chevron, it's Exxon, it's Total, it's Valero, it's the major refining companies uh, in the world. There's not a lot of barrels sitting in tanks waiting for SOMO to sell it. The Kurds have announced COMO as an organization, the Kurdistan Oil Marketing Organization. This was announced in January. COMO is a legal entity established under the Kurdistan oil and gas law. So we've known about it since 2007. And what I expect is that we'll see some type of SOMO-COMO marriage uh, over the short term, where they jointly manage and jointly market uh, the oil out of this region uh, in the short term. Uh, but really, marketing is not the major issue. Control of the money. Uh, is the major issue. Baghdad has not given any option that allows the Kurds to manage the money in these negotiations. The Kurds have gone opposite and said, we want to manage all the money and we will share with you. I think it's important to understand, and, and I also legally agree, that the Kurds reject the notion that revenue must be generated at the center and pass out. There is no constitutional or legal basis for that, that uh, theory or that option. There is nothing to say that revenue cannot be generated outside and passed in to the center based on, that, based on those laws. So the Kurds going into this reject the notion that it must be center out, they say out in, uh, is quite fine uh, with us. Baghdad doesn't accept that, of course, for reasons we talked about earlier, Basra, Anbar, and these, these uh, situations. Currently, when a barrel of Iraqi oil is sold, the money is transferred from the buyer to an account in New York at the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank is the U.S. version of the central bank. The Iraqis hold an account there it used to be a managed account by the United Nations. It is no longer, it's now an account managed by the Iraqis. Baghdad likes to put a lot of misinformation in the media about this. The money must go there. It's mandated it must go there. The only thing that mandates the money going to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York is the 2013 Iraqi budget law, which says all oil revenue must be deposited into what we call the DFI, the Development Fund for Iraq. That account is no longer protected by the United Nations, but it is protected by the U.S. government. We have given, our president has given it special status uh, to keep anyone who wants to make claims against Iraq from being able to touch it. It's protected. That status runs out in 
May of this year, I think, maybe April, I'm sorry, the date's just not coming clearly to my head. Uh, so far, each year the President has extended that, understanding that it's an important time still for Iraq's development, but we'll see uh, what happens this year. So barrels sold, the buyer pays money into that account, and that account is now controlled by the Central Bank of Iraq, and that money is then transferred to the Iraqi Treasury in country for uh, use to run the government. Baghdad's vision is that that process will happen for Kurdish oil as well, and they will give 17% of sales revenue from the Kurdish oil to the KRG via its monthly budget transfer. For 2014, if you look at projected numbers, that's about $2.5 billion which is about the amount of money needed to pay the oil companies for producing the oil. Baghdad says, look, we think your goal is to be able to pay your contractors and then share in total Iraqi revenue. The Kurds say, yes, in principle, this is, this is what we're asking for. So Baghdad feels like it's offering a system to allow that to happen. The Kurds say, wait, 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 wait. We've had three agreements with you in the past. The last agreement was signed by both cabinets and passed by both cabinets, and Baghdad has always failed to pay the agreed amounts of money to the Kurdistan region. Erbil says, I don't trust you with the money. And they have reason not to trust. Baghdad hasn't given reason to trust. So we need some type of control over that flow of money. And can we arrive at a short term where, yes, paying our contractors and we share overall Iraqi revenue works for us? Yes. But we have to talk about control of the money. And there are some interesting ideas that are talked about in negotiations. There's the idea of selling oil to the Turkish market. What Turkey buys, they transfer the money directly to the KRG for that portion that gives the KRG money to pay its operators. And then the Kurds continue to get their monthly budget allocation uh, from Baghdad. There's the idea that a sub-account will be opened in New York, where a portion of the money goes into, and the Kurds have the ability to draw the money. It doesn't have to go New York, Baghdad, Erbil. It can go New York, uh, Erbil. Ideas are still on the table where the Kurds completely collect the money, minus off what Baghdad owes it, and then returns the balance. Uh, to Baghdad. So there are a lot of good ideas on the table uh, to solve the problem. Once again, I feel we'll get there to a solution. It probably won't last more than a year, especially as the Kurds are able to generate enough revenue to, to break even with the revenue that they receive uh, from Baghdad. So that's a little bit about risk internally. I, I mean, we can talk about risk internally within the KRG as well, as government formation happens, as different political players play against each other. What I don't see, even with a rising opposition uh, in uh, Kurdistan, is the desire to flip the oil and gas situation here. Uh, Ali Hamasala is very famous. I'm sure many of you watch him on, uh, on television as he talks about the numbers uh, from the Goran party. He's smart on these things. We need, he, he's smart on these things. Uh, and. These are the right questions and right statements to be putting out. But even to, uh, to that level, I don't think we see anybody who wants to kind of flip the situation here, cancel all the agreements, uh, and move to a different model. This one's working. So for oil and gas, internal political dynamic, I think we're, we're probably uh, OK. We've talked about Iraq in general. Now we talk about the region. Wow, Turkey. Turkey's making itself the big brother. There are. We could say four routes to get Turkish, or to, I'm sorry, to get Kurdish oil and gas to markets. It could go to Iran, which it does by tanker truck now. But everyone knows of the sanctions in Iran, uh, the transparency of Iran, uh, and these types of issues. It can go south to Baghdad. Baghdad's already proven it's not a reliable partner. It could go west to Syria. I think that's highly unlikely right now to be able to build such a large piece of pipeline infrastructure through Syria uh, out to the port. You have multiple Kurdish groups fighting each other across that area. You have, uh, you have multiple Syrian groups fighting each other throughout that area. And of course, you have our uh, Al-Qaeda as well fighting uh, in that area. 
And so that leaves Turkey. And how convenient. Turkey has a pipeline uh, on its territory already, uh, as well as Turkey has a great demand for energy. A great demand for energy. They produce no more than 100,000 barrels a day. And they burn millions. It's a country of 80 million people, quite, quite large. It's moving from dirtier fuels like coal into gas for its power generation and industry. It's needy. That's the best neighbor you can have, someone who needs what you have. But you also need what they have, an export uh, market, somewhere to send it to. I don't have any indication uh, that the Turks uh, are trying uh, to act like gangsters uh, in these negotiations. Uh, the, the ministry, the Prime Minister's office here, uh, I can tell you, has represented the people of Pakistan very well, and the people of Iraq, because this is a shared resource for all of Iraq, uh, very well uh, in these negotiations. Uh, Jordan gets a much better deal uh, on Iraqi oil uh, than Turkey gets uh, under, under this agreement. Should the agreements be published? Should the people be able to comment on it? I'm a transparency guy, yes, what's it going to hurt? While negotiations are going on, sometimes you like to keep a little bit of information back uh, to use at the negotiation table. So I can understand uh, that if that's the reason. Uh, but as the people, I would be demanding further transparency uh, as time goes on uh, for these things. Before we move on a bit to resource risk, I'm happy to answer any questions that may pop up in, in, in kind of the political risk uh, segment of of this. I'll make one final comment then. International oil companies are quite fine with the political risk that they face in Iraq, and especially here in the Kurdistan region. We've seen multiple peaceful transfers of power. We've seen people vote. We've seen the emergence of opposition parties. We see press, multiple streams of press, some independent. Most not, uh, but at least multiple streams of press. Those things, I think, encourage international uh, oil companies to accept uh, the political uh, risks uh, that they face. All right, let's talk a little bit about resource then. As I tell you, resource is no problem. I mean, the number of barrels below the ground are there. Uh, the gas levels are there. Uh, the people of Kurdistan will not have to worry uh, about gasoline in their tanks or gas in their heaters. Uh, going, going forward uh, in the future. Okay, this has a lot of buttons on it. Which one goes forward, do you know? Oh, it's just the ball. Oh, no, that moves. Wow. Look that up. Now, which way I go forward? Ah, ah okay. They put the button underneath, not even on top. <laughs> Very nice. What I want to talk about on resource, though, is really what the expectations of the people are and where, where Kurdistan falls with a group of peer nations. If you look at, can you hear me when I speak like this? OK, excellent. The ministry's plan, if you look at it, by 2015 is to pr produce a million, oh, hello. Wow. I won't touch it. <laughs> the ministry's plan by 2015 is to produce a million barrels a day. That's 365 million barrels a year. The World Energy Institute expects that in 2015, oil will sell for $102 a barrel. Currently, it's at about 107, 108. You can see the price of oil is is uh, looking to come down over time as new resource comes on, especially resource from the United States as we emerge once again as one of the largest producers in the world. By the time you discount this, last month's SOMOS discount at Jehan was $3.50 a barrel. You transport it and you handle it. That cost about $10. Oil companies in 2015 will probably need about 15% of that barrel to both pay for their costs and their profits. 
So that gets us another $14 or so. So the CARE-G will generate for itself $78 net per barrel. That's 28.5 billion US dollars. Currently from the Baghdad budget, the Kurds get about 12 billion, 12.7 billion. So you can see that's double by 2015, the amount of revenue that's able to be generated. The Ministry of Planning predicts that there will be 5.2 million people in the Kurdistan region in 2015. That gets us to 5,500, roughly, per capita national oil income for the region. 